Hi, Todd Dunn here. This is another video in my continuing series on chronic lymphocytic leukemia, or CLL. In this video, I want to talk about just what your options are now in February 2018 if you're looking at your first treatment for CLL. I want to also remind you that I am not a doctor. I am a CLL patient myself who just spends perhaps a little too much time reading about CLL. So your doctor has told you after a period in watch and wait that it's time for therapy and that your choices are chemotherapy or targeted therapy. Well, what does that mean? What are some of the implications of the two different options? And is it only two options? That's what I'm going to be talking about today in this video. Basically, what are the currently approved therapies for frontline or first treatment for CLL? And I'll be addressing chemoimmunotherapy and targeted therapy. First, I'd like to look at chemoimmunotherapy. There are currently, in 2018, three different chemoimmunotherapies that are approved for first-line treatment of CLL. They are fludarabine plus cyclophosphamide plus rituximab, where rituximab, a CD20 monoclonal antibody, is the immunotherapy part of the treatment. This is also called FCR. The second chemoimmunotherapy treatment that is approved is bendamustine plus rituximab, where bendamustine is an alkylating agent and rituximab is, again, a monoclonal CD20 antibody. And finally, there is chlorambucil, which is also an alkylating agent that comes in the form of pills, plus the monoclonal antibody obinutuzumab. So these are your three options when it comes to chemoimmunotherapy. And what I'm going to do now is talk a little bit about each of them. Now let's take a look at FCR therapy. FCR is the most intense of the three approved chemotherapy regimens for frontline treatment of CLL. As a consequence, it's generally restricted to younger patients, where younger means less than 65, in otherwise good health, which broadly speaking means normal creatinine clearance, which indicates good kidney function because these drugs are largely cleared from the body by the kidneys, and no or only minor comorbidities. FCR therapy can give very long remissions in excess of 10 years for some patients, and those are patients who have a 13Q deletion and mutated IGVH gene. Other patients don't do as well. In fact, it is not recommended that patients with a 17P deletion or a mutated P53 gene take FCR therapy simply because those two characteristics mean that the patients are refractory to chemotherapy, and if they get into remission, it will be a short remission. On the negative side, FCR can cause significant myelosuppression. In other words, it can damage the bone marrow and result in persistent low blood counts for all types of blood cells. But of those, low neutrophil counts or neutropenia is very common and can result in significant infection problems in 20 to 30 percent or more of patients. Furthermore, FCR, because it damages cell DNA, increases the risk for secondary cancers and it can cause clonal evolution of the CLLB cells 
leading to a more aggressive variant or perhaps a more chemotherapy resistant variant of CLL upon eventual relapse. That brings us to BR or bendamustine plus rituximab therapy. This second chemotherapy regimen is not considered to be as aggressive as FCR therapy in that it has a much more benign side effect profile. Consequently, it's available to older patients, older than 65, who are also less healthy overall and perhaps have a few minor comorbidities. In general, BR therapy does not produce quite as long remissions as FCR therapy, particularly for younger patients. But recent uh, clinical study results from Germany have shown that BR therapy can produce broadly comparable remission links for patients over the age of 65 to FCR therapy. Like FCR therapy, BR therapy can cause significant myelosuppression with low blood counts and neutropenia being one of the main concerns. It also, like FCR, increases the risk of secondary cancers and can cause clonal evolution leading to a more aggressive variant of CLL upon relapse. But as I said, it is a choice for older patients who perhaps are not quite as fit and wouldn't be candidates for FCR therapy. In particular, again, patients with a 13Q deletion and mutated IGVH gene can be expected to do relatively well on BR therapy. And once again, it is not recommended for people with a 17P deletion or mutated P53 gene who would be resistant to chemotherapy. The final chemotherapy regimen is chlorambucil plus the CD20 monoclonal antibody obinutuzumab. This is the least aggressive of the chemoimmunotherapies that are currently approved for frontline therapy. As a consequence, it is available to both elderly and frail patients. The chemotherapy aspect of it, chlorambucil, is much less aggressive than fludarabine plus cyclophosphamide or bendamustine. The side effects are also much less pronounced than with either FCR or BR therapies. One side effect, though, that can be a problem is late onset neutropenia. In other words, after you finish the therapy, you might find neutropenia developing. This seems to be a characteristic of the monoclonal antibody obinutuzumab. There is some increase of risk for secondary cancers, although with elderly patients that isn't as much of a concern because they simply, because they don't have much lifespan left, don't have the time necessary to develop secondary cancers. And also it can cause clonal evolution leading to more aggressive CLL upon ultimate relapse. Finally, this particular therapy tends to produce much less uh, enduring remissions than either FCR or BR. In fact, in the clinical trial that led to the approval of chlorambucil plus obinutuzumab, the median progression-free survival, or the time to progression of the disease, was only about two and a half years. So this is a more benign therapy suitable for older people and frail people, but it does not necessarily produce a particularly durable remission. That brings us to targeted therapies. At present, the only targeted therapy approved for frontline treatment of CLL is the BTK inhibitor, ibrutinib. Ibrutinib works by binding to and blocking the Bruton's tyrosine kinase signaling pathway in B cell receptors. And this leads to cell death. It works well for all genetic variants of CLL, including 11Q and 17P. 
So it is at this time the preferred frontline treatment for people with the 17p chromosomal deletion. It's also effective at driving CLL B cells out of microenvironments in the lymphatic system. In other words, if you have swollen lymph nodes and an enlarged spleen, a brute nib tends to clear the lymphocytes out of those areas and transfer them into the peripheral blood where they can then be killed off by the drug. A consequence of this is that when you start the drug, you will notice an increase in lymphocyte count for the first month or two as the drug moves the lymphocytes from the lymph nodes and spleen into the peripheral blood. A brutinib also has a much lower side effect profile than any of the chemotherapies with the exception of chlorambucil plus obinutuzumab therapy. That's not to say that it doesn't have side effects, but in general, they're much less intense. And some people have almost no side effects. The most common side effects are bruising and bleeding, joint and muscle pain, heart rhythm problems like atrial fibrillation, and the development of skin rashes. That brings us to the question of should you select targeted therapy, ibrutinib, or one of the three available chemoimmunotherapy regimens. First off, chemoimmunotherapy is relatively short duration. It lasts about six months. In fact, under normal circumstances, it consists of six cycles, each of which is 28 days long, where you really only have treatment during the first two or three days of the cycle, and the rest of the time, you are recovering from the treatment to get ready for the next cycle. So you might only have 15 days of treatment throughout an entire six cycle treatment procedure with a chemoimmunotherapy. Chemoimmunotherapy is also generally an infused therapy. In other words, you go into the doctor's office, the clinic, or the infusion a clinic at the hospital and get the drugs infused into you by IV. The only exception to this is the chlorambucil abinutuzumab regimen in which the chlorambucil is pills that you take two days a month and obinutuzumab is an infused therapy that you would have at the beginning of each month. Targeted therapy in contrast consists of daily pills that you get from the pharmacy and you take at home. The only time you would go in is for periodic blood tests. The downside of targeted therapy is that it is in, of indefinite duration, potentially for the rest of your life, or until you can no longer tolerate the side effects or you relapse. So this can be a very long therapy. And there are also some cost considerations. For people on Medicare, which is most people with CLL, chemoimmunotherapy is covered by Medicare Part B. And if you have a supplement, it'll pay the additional 20%. So there'll be no charge to you, with the exception of the chlorambucil, which would as a prescription drug would be covered under Medicare Part D, and your cost for chlorambucil for a full course of therapy would be in the $2,000 range. Targeted therapy, on the other hand, because it is a prescription drug that you get from the pharmacy, is only covered under Medicare Part D. Unfortunately, ibrutinib is a very, very expensive drug. It costs about $140 to $150 thousand dollars a year. Your insurance will pick up most of that, but the co-pays under Medicare Part D are in the nine to ten thousand dollar a year range. Depending on your income, you may be able to get assistance from one of the foundations to pay some of the co-pays, but you're still going to probably have several thousand dollars a year of co-pays to deal with. That said, 
Some people, however, will opt for FCR chemoimmunotherapy if they have a 13Q deletion and mutated IGVH gene because they have a shot at getting a very long remission, potentially as long as 15 or 20 years, which, depending on your age, might be the equivalent to being cured. Well, that covers the available approved options for frontline treatment for CLL. There are, however, other options. First off, there are clinical trials. If you want to try a new drug or a new combination of drugs that might potentially put you into a complete remission for a long time. Unfortunately, most clinical trials are limited to relapsed or refractory CLL and aren't open to people uh, for frontline treatment, but there are a few. They tend to be geographically limited though, so if you're not in the right place or willing to travel, you may not be able to do that. Another option is off-label treatment using another approved drug or combination of drugs. This opportunity is available, but it may be difficult to get insurance coverage in that insurance companies are reluctant to approve off-label use of drugs. Okay, that pretty much finishes what I wanted to say about the available frontline or first treatments for CLL. If you found this presentation useful, please click the thumbs up button and give me a like. And I'd appreciate a subscription to my channel. Thanks for listening.